This video is supported by Skillshare. As many of you know, I grew up in Texas, and you know about this because I talk about it kind of a lot. How do you know someone's from Texas? Just wait, they'll tell you. Texans are basically country vegans. Anyway, growing up, my grandparents had a ranch out near Abilene, Texas, and it probably is not a surprise to you to hear that uh, there were guns around. I'm not really a, a gun guy these days, but I definitely grew up around guns. And if you're wondering why I'm talking about guns in a quantum physics video, it's because, hey, that never splits a crowd. Actually, it's because one of those guns almost killed me. You don't, you don't need the sound. It's, it's, it's dramatic enough. But at one point, we were out at the tank. Uh, the tank is like a man-made pond, a little reservoir where the cows come and drink and stuff like that. But um, my cousin saw a bird on the other side of the tank, so he went, you know, raised his rifle to take a shot at it. I saw something about five feet to my left, and I took one step toward it. And that's when my cousin shot at the bird. I heard the bullet ricochet off a rock and then go... It literally passed inches behind my head. Like, the shockwave of the bullet actually blew my hair up a little bit. If I hadn't moved exactly when I did, that bullet would have hit me in the head. Now, granted, it was a 22. that's very small caliber, and it had already lost a lot of kinetic energy when it ricocheted off, but uh, that would have been a very bad day. Maybe a bad month. The point is, that's one of many dozens of days in my life that I can look back on and ask myself, if I had done something even just the tiniest bit different, how much would that have changed my life? According to one interpretation of quantum physics, there is a world out there, a real world, where I don't exist because I died that day. And there's a world where I picked a different college, there's a world where I didn't get on a plane, where I crossed a different street, and that is true for every decision I've ever made in my life and every decision of every single human being on this planet. This is the many worlds interpretation. Get a brain bucket ready. Consider the air. We think of it as empty space. We experience it as empty space. But it's actually filled to the brim with atoms and molecules and trillions upon trillions of subatomic particles. Every time I wave my hand in front of the camera, I'm interacting with trillions upon trillions of subatomic particles. Electrons and protons being forced out of position. Photons, little particles of light bouncing off of my hand into the camera. Just this little small space I can create as much chaos as Ryan Johnson in a Star Wars convention. I say chaos, but of course the motion of my hand is controlling the path that these subatomic particles are taking, but what if they took a different path? According to quantum mechanics, not only can particles take multiple paths, they act as if they do. And this shows up as interference, like in the famous double slit experiment, which I've covered before. Quick refresher, though, in the double slit experiment, experimenters fire protons at a photographic plate through a barrier with two gaps. The photons show up on the plate as an interference pattern, which confirms that they travel as waves because they collide with each other once they get past the slits. Where the experiment really gets weird is when you only fire one photon through at a time, because even though no two photons go through at the same time, you still get an interference pattern, which means the photon is colliding with something? What exactly is going on here? This has puzzled some of the greatest minds in physics for the last hundred years, and several interpretations have come out because of it. The most popular interpretation of quantum physics was developed by Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg in Copenhagen around the year 1925. This is why it's known as the Copenhagen interpretation. Louis de Broglie came up with the pilot wave interpretation of quantum mechanics at about the same time. I've also covered that in a video here. Both of these interpretations share the belief that the measured path of the particle is the only real path and all the other paths are only potentialities. But about 30 years later, a slightly drunk student at Princeton disagreed with this. While sipping on sherry, or so the story goes, Hugh Everett III started to ask the question, what if all these other paths really are real and really do exist in other realities? Realities that then interfere with the paths in our reality, hence the interference pattern. This, of course, would mean that there are infinite numbers of realities for each path of every single particle in existence all the time. Why? Whatever do you mean that sounds crazy? This sounds like it's time for a woo-woo alarm. But wait. Perhaps reality as we know it only seems special to us because it's the one that we live in. The many worlds interpretation suggests that there are infinite possibilities out there in other realities that are just as real to other people in those realities. There's a reality where a, a mouse sneezed and they didn't sneeze in this reality, and there's a reality where you did or did not get married. Everett's ideas were, um, not well received. 
let's just say, uh, Niels Bohr was still around at the time and he had a way of kind of shutting down anybody that challenged the Copenhagen interpretation. After all, this was just a paper by a PhD student and I'm Niels Bohr, b You're messing with the Bohr hole. He never called himself the Bohr hole. But Everett did get a lot of pushback from his paper. Even his uh, thesis advisor urged him to change it because he knew that it would not be received very well thanks to Niels Bohr out there being a borehole. So Everett took a hint and got out of the field of quantum mechanics and actually took a job advising the Pentagon on sort of doomsday scenarios. And that was where the idea stayed, relegated to the dustbin of history for the next two decades before Bryce DeWitt rediscovered it and thought it sounded kind of interesting. Bryce DeWitt was the acting editor of the Reviews of Modern Physics in 1973, and he ran across this paper and was just kind of blown away that nothing ever came of it. He called it a new and refreshing take on reality. DeWitt published the full paper in book form in 1973 with Everett's permission, and uh, this time with Niels Bohr long gone, it was received much better. And since the 1970s, the many worlds interpretation has gone from sort of a fringe science idea to something that many physicists are actually kind of starting to get behind. Stephen Hawking was a fan, Richard Feynman was a fan, although to hear physicists tell it, Richard Feynman was a fan of literally everything. One of the most prominent proponents of many worlds interpretation right now is David Deutsch, who is a quantum computer pioneer, but his cool factor went through the roof when his name was mentioned in Avengers Endgame. The many worlds interpretation has sort of evolved over the years, as all theories do. Uh, DeWitt actually is the one who coined the term many worlds, and other people have refined on the idea as well. Now, there are a lot of things worth knowing about many worlds, but for the sake of simplicity, I have narrowed it down to five. Number one, many worlds respect Schrodinger. The big debates about quantum theory back in the day fell into two camps, really. There were the realists, which were uh, supported by Einstein, and the instrumentalists, which Bohr was the leader of. Einstein and Bohr famously clashed over this at the Solvay Conference in 1927. It was basically WrestleMania for nerds. And both of these stances are basically different ways of looking at Schrodinger's equation, which predicts that particles can take many paths. An instrumentalist would argue that it's helpful for us to predict all the different possible paths, while a realist would say that there's only one path and we're just missing something. So the many worlds interpretation kind of falls in line more with the realist camp because what it says that we're missing is all these other paths and these other actual realities. So it doesn't conflict with Schrodinger's equation. Number two, many worlds depends on a universal wave function. What the Schrodinger equation describes is the change over time in a wave function. Speaking generally, the wave function describes the state of a quantum particle or a set of quantum particles, and this can mean momentum, spin, and position. In many worlds, there's a theoretical wave function that describes the state of the entire universe at a specific time. This makes it kind of a deterministic idea. So there is no fundamental randomness or any hidden variables that pulls an actual state from a possible state. All possible states and all possible paths are real. Three, in many worlds, wave functions don't collapse. Wave function collapse is a feature of the Copenhagen interpretation where uh, particles in superposition determined by a wave function until that position is measured and then the wave function collapses. That doesn't happen in the many worlds interpretation. Now granted, we see a wave function collapse, but that's only because we inhabit the same reality as the path that was taken in that reality. So this collapse is only relative to our point of view. Believers in the Mandela effect kind of rely on this interpretation to explain why things that they remember to be true are not true now. They think that maybe they have crossed from one reality to another. Number four, worlds are created by measurement. This is the pop science idea that spawned a million movie scripts. In many worlds, the entire universe is in a superposition of states. And when we measure something, we kind of diverge into that reality. Essentially, we've created a new world for ourselves in that measured state to live in. So for every value that measurement could have shown, a universe exists where that value was shown. But it's important to note that no matter what universe you live in, it is still governed by that universal wave function. Now, I've been careful to use the word world and not universe when I'm talking about diverging realities. Many uh, movies that use this as a plot device are not quite so careful. I mean, after all, from my perspective, the world that I live in is universal in scope and consistent. You know, I can, I can look back through time and trace back the entire history of the world through cause and effect. Um, so it stands to reason that somebody in a different reality could do the same thing in that they have a universe all to themselves. Here's the thing, though and you might want to be sitting down for this. Five, there is only one universe. The concepts around the Schrodinger equation imply that the universe is in a superposition of states, and if the universe is in a superposition of states, then so are we. My state, including the state of my memories, is in a superposition. So are your memories, so are your mom's memories, so are your dog's memories. Maybe that's why my dog always forgets what come inside means. 
There's no reason for another universe because everything that can happen does happen simultaneously in this one universe. So while it might be tempting to think of these other worlds as other universes in the strict Everett D. Witten sense, uh, the word worlds might be plural, but universe is singular. The universal wave function changes over time, according to the Schrodinger equation, but the fact that the universe is in superposition does not change. And we remain in superposition as well. From the universal perspective, we exist in all possible states 100% of the time. So if your brain feels kind of scrambled from trying to understand the many worlds interpretation, that's because it kind of is. Really the biggest question that comes out of all this is what does all of that mean? Many worlds is a fully deterministic interpretation, which means that our choices are only as real as the choices we didn't make. Does that mean there's no free will? Does that mean there's another universe out there where I didn't take that one step over and a bullet rip through my head? Or maybe didn't rip through my head, but caused me to miss half a semester of school or, or maybe just bounced right off of me and I'm bulletproof. Maybe I'm immortal in that world. That sounds badass. I want to go to there. Truth is, you could run down a million rabbit holes of different things that you could have done in your past and how that could have changed your present, but the fact of the matter is, if you are still breathing, you still have choices and you can still affect your future. And for that, one thing that's always good for you to work on is to get better at productivity and develop better habits, and that's something that you can learn at Skillshare. Skillshare, of course, is an online learning platform where you can learn just about anything that you're interested in from teachers around the world who've done that thing you want to do and want to share that knowledge with you. And I can highly recommend the course Productivity Habits That Stick by Mike Vardy. Mike Vardy is a productivity expert and the author of several books on the subject. He's been featured in Lifehacker, The Next Web, and Huffington Post, and he's given TEDx talks on getting things done. In this course, he'll teach you how to time theme your days to work more efficiently, create daily routines, and use tools to become a true master hacker of time. Let's face it, we all live hectic lives, we always feel like we're constantly catching up on things all the time. Getting a handle on these little life hacks about getting productivity down and stuff can actually give you a feeling of control over your life. So it's definitely worth you know, checking out. And if you're one of the first 500 people to click the link in the description down below, you can try this course out for free for two months. It'll take you less than two months, a few hours at most, but then you can look at all the other things that they have at Skillshare, which is there's thousands of courses out there. It's basically the closest thing we have to plugging in your head in the matrix and learning Kung Fu. So you have no excuse. Get your reality in order and learn everything else in the world there is to know over at Skillshare. Links down in the description. Big thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are forming a great community, doing great things and supporting this channel, keeping the lights on. I love you guys. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, access to me, and just join this wonderful community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it and you had your mind blown. And if this is your first time here, uh, maybe check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that one or any of the others with my little blue thing on it. And, uh, and if you like those, please do subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and Thursday on sciencey and futuristic topics like this and other things. As always, t-shirts are available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. They're cool, they're fun, they're nerdy. People will look at it and go, hey, and you want people to do that. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.